morning. Thank you so much for being here today and for worshiping. Thank you to our praise team for leading us in worship and all those who have led us in worship so far. I'm excited today, my friends. I don't often get to preach on St. Patrick's Day. And uh, like I, I said, it's my dad's birthday, and it's a, a special day for me. My ancestry is Scotch-Irish, and so it's a, you know, we all, every culture has a day that, that is, is, or multiple days that are sort of are theirs. And so I get excited on St. Patrick's Day. So this morning I'm going to do a couple of things I don't normally do. Uh, the bulk of the sermon is going to be a story, and it happens to be a true story. But first, I'm going to do something that I don't usually like when other preachers do it. I'm going to read, I'm going to read the scripture text, and then we're going to talk about something else for a long time. But we'll eventually come back to the scripture text, so don't fear. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 11, is the Apostle Paul writing to uh, a group of believers, and he is... Um, this is the, the part of his letter where he, this happens a lot in Paul, where he begins the letter talking about, broadly speaking, theology. He tells who God is and, and what God has done. And then the second part of the letter, he starts talking about, and now let's talk about you. Uh, what are we supposed to do, knowing what God has done and knowing who God is? What then are we supposed to do? So Colossians 3, 5 through 11, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, in other words, because of all the things we've talked about so far, about who Jesus is and who God is, Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is on account of these things that the wrath of God will come. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. Now, let's talk about something else for a while. Actually, I'm going to do the other thing that I don't usually like when other preachers do it, which is to take one word out of these verses and talk about that for a while. And the word I want to talk about is barbarians. Did you notice it in verse 11? The barbarians. This is in Paul's list of different kinds of people. And of course, Paul's point is that when it comes to the gospel and when it comes to what Christ has done, there are only two kinds of people. There are the people that Christ has changed and the people that Christ is renewing and the people that Christ wants to renew, but that have not allowed him to do that yet. Uh, so verse 11 in Paul's list of people uh, are barbarians. And you and I probably have a certain image in our mind when you hear the word barbarians. Several years ago, the Capital One commercials were using barbarians. You remember those? Yeah. What's in your wallet? And it's, you th sort of think of like a Viking, a, a hairy person with wearing hair and wearing armor and uh, just sort of a, a, a rough person. Paul and his readers at the church in Colossae probably had a somewhat wider view of what a barbarian was. Uh, at the widest possible meaning, and it had, it had been a word that had been around a long time, even before uh, this, but the widest possible meaning was someone who didn't speak Greek. When Alexander the Great conquered most of the Mediterranean and off into India, one of the things he did was make sure that everywhere he went, he said, the official, congratulations, the official language is now Greek. And so everybody from India to uh, modern day France learned Greek or anybody, if you wanted to do business, uh, if it was the language of business and the language of the government. And so uh, almost anybody in the Mediterranean world, if you looked around, you could find someone who spoke Greek. And the barbarians were people who hadn't got the memo. Uh, they didn't speak Greek. Um, and in fact, the, the word barbarian is, this is one of my favorite words, an onomatopoeia. You know what an onomatopoeia is, right? An onomatopoeia is a word that makes a sound like, buzz. It, you know, the word sounds like whatever the noise is you're trying to make. Bark, uh, quack, quack. Uh, that's, those are onomatopoeias. And so barbarian is an onomatopoeia because that's what they sounded like to Greek people. When Greek people went out and they met people who didn't speak Greek, to them it sounded like them going bar, 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 bar. And they just, they thought they sounded dumb. And that's what, it, what, the, what the word meant. You guys, you ignorant people who don't know Greek can just sound like bar, 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 bar. Uh, of course, to the Greeks, 
If you didn't speak Greek, that meant you were uncivilized. And that's usually what the word still means today. If you call someone a barbarian, uh, you mean that they are living or acting in an uncivilized way, whatever that meant. To a lot of people, especially to people who lived in cities, it meant people who didn't live in cities. It meant nomads. So when Abraham and his flocks come into Egypt, the Egyptians would have said, who are these people who don't even live in a city? Just living out there in the countryside. But then Paul narrows it down in verse 11. Paul says, barbarians and Scythians. Uh, you probably never met any Scythians, neither have I. They were nomadic people, nomadic warriors, who lived in northern Iran. Um, they were about half legendary in Paul's time. There were rumors that they were a part animal uh, and that they would, would eat people. Uh, there was that kind of barbarian, the people on the farthest reaches of the known world, the people who uh, may not even be fully human. And the reason Paul mentions them is because they are the prime example of the people that he's talking to. If you were going to talk about people who you would assume are out of reach, out of reach geographically, they are way out there, out of reach culturally, they are different from us, out of reach intellectually, it may not even be worth your time to get to know them. And Paul's point is that they are, of course, not outside the boundary of the gospel. Even Scythians, he's trying to say, even barbarians, nobody is left out. Nobody is outside the boundary of the people that God wants to be part of his family, the people that God wants to be part of the fellowship of believers. So keep that in mind. We'll come back to that. And what I want to talk about are not the specific barbarians that Paul mentions, the Scythians, but the people on the other end of the Roman Empire. Uh, the Scythians were the people at the edge of the known world at that time to the east. But we're going to talk about the barbarians that were on the edge of the known world to the west. The barbarians who throughout the history of Western civilization have generally been referred to as a little backward, kind of more Stone Age than civilized, and maybe more than half crazy. Uh, G.K. Chesterton, who was British, said that they were the men that God made mad, for all their wars are merry and all their songs are sad. I'm talking about the Irish. The specific <laughs> tribal name was the Celts, Celts with a C. But it wasn't too long before they were called the Irish. The Irish, just to give you a picture of what kind of people the Irish were at this time, the Irish were the kind of people that the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire who had conquered Britain, the island of Britain, and made it part of the Roman Empire. They went all the way out to Britain and said, this is our spot. They looked over at the next island over, just, just one island over, and they said, no, that's okay. <laughs> you guys, you do your thing. Did you know the Roman Empire went all the way to Britain? Uh, London was built by Romans, uh, and there are still places in London where you can see Roman walls. Uh, the Romans conquered and civilized the barbarian tribes of Britain, uh, but the Celts they had a little problem with. The Celts lived in Scotland and they lived in Ireland. The Celts in Scotland, they built a wall to keep the Celts over there and the, the Romans and the British Romans over here. And the wall didn't work, by the way. It turns out that walls are not very effective solutions to complicated social problems. I don't know if you, didn't know if you guys knew that. But they didn't need a wall for Ireland. It came with a natural barrier. It's an island. There was a channel that you had to cross to get to Ireland. So the Roman Empire grew and got old, and the Roman Empire eventually became a Christian empire. We'll talk about that in a second. And the Irish were just left alone over there, and they just kept doing what they'd been doing from ancient times. What had they been doing since ancient times? Uh, they had a lot of the qualities that the Greeks would have thought to be barbaric. They were non-literate. They did not have a written language. They did not read or write. They did not have any cities. They had kings, a lot of kings and queens, who usually lived in small villages, and they ruled small parcels of land, and that was their kingdom. Occasionally, they'd have a high king. That was supposed to rotate, but usually they just fought over it. Um, they had a lot of kings, a lot of queens. The wealth of the kings was measured in livestock, measured in precious metals and gems, and measured in slaves. So the amount of cows you had, the amount of slaves you had, the amount of gold you had, that was your wealth. Irish kings and queens uh, fought each other all the time to get more of those things. Livestock, precious metals, and slaves. Now, if all that sounds, you know, not that unusual to you, think about this. Think about if you were going to go to war with another kingdom, you gather your army and you say, everybody got your swords? Check. Everybody got your bows and arrows? Check. Everybody got your spears? Yes. All right, there's only one thing left to do. Let's all take off all our clothes. And then we're ready to go fight. They fought naked. Uh, think about that for a second. Uh, they got had the, all their weapons. 
and they didn't put on any armor, they didn't even put on clothes. They stripped down naked and that's how they fought. These people were crazy. The Roman Empire, who conquered everything they saw, looked over there and thought, I don't really want to fight those naked people. We're just going to stay over here. Think how crazy you have, your culture has to be. The fiercest warriors were admired for their ability to become so enraged before a battle that their appearance would change. Not just that they put on angry face, but they looked like a different person. They became so angry before they started to fight. That's the kind of people that the Celts were. Um, the Celts worshipped a variety of gods who were present all around them in the natural world. Everything uh, was under the, the influence of some kind of spirit. Some were good, some were evil, uh, some were friendly and some were not. And your handy neighborhood druids were the ones who were the religious people and they helped the kings and everyone else keep these gods and spirits happy. And one of the ways to keep the gods happy was human sacrifice. Occasionally the gods desired the sacrifice of one of these slaves, usually the slaves. So ancient Ireland was a brutal place. Warriors and kings, they had drinking halls. That was part of the village. And they would decorate their drinking halls with the heads of their enemies along the sides. Sometimes they'd decorate their belts with the heads of their enemies. They would literally drink out of the skulls of their enemies. They'd hollow it out and make a nice little drinking cup out of a skull. That was ancient Ireland. That, and that was what life in Ireland was like from the Stone Age very nearly to the fall of Rome. And within, but, but, Within a generation, all that changed because something amazing happened, and it started with a 16-year-old boy named Patricius. Patricius was a Roman citizen who grew up in Britain sometime around the year 400 AD, 400 years after the birth of Christ, and this is just a few years after Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. It was tolerated for a couple of generations, and then it became the official religion. So Patricius, in Britain there, came from a very religious family. His father was a deacon in the church, his grandfather was a priest, and Patricius didn't believe in God. This is one of the things that sort of happens sometimes when you have an official religion. Uh, Patricius was, officially speaking, a Christian, but he was a Christian of convenience. Uh, he was a Christian because it paid to be Christian in a, a, an empire where Christianity was the official religion. It didn't mean anything to him. Everybody he knew was Christian. He, he would have said he was a Christian, but he didn't actually believe in God. It didn't make any difference to him. It had little to do with his life. But when he was 16, something very unusual happened to him. Uh, Veggie Tales has a little short version of his story, and I like the way that Veggie Tales says it. It says, um, he was a boy a lot like other boys. He went to church. He went to school. He played outside. He got kidnapped by pirates. Um, <laughs> At age 16, Irish pirates, Irish raiders, sailed across the channel, and they, they landed in Britain, and they kidnapped people for slaves. And Patricius was one of the people they kidnapped. And they took him to Ireland, and they made him a slave, and his job was to be a shepherd. Uh, he was a shepherd for one of these, these minor kings. And his job was to keep the sheep alive. Whether he lived or died, they didn't so much care, but his job was to keep the sheep alive. So he lived outside with the sheep. He lived outside in all weather and his life depended on keeping those animals alive. He didn't know anyone there. He did not speak the language. Uh, he was constantly hungry. He was often naked, and he was a long way from home with no way to get back. And it was here that Patricius learned, learned to do something that he did not learn to do. He did, had not taken the time to learn to do from his grandfather or his father. He learned to pray. Uh, he later said that he prayed 100 times a day and almost as much at night, and he spent six years this way. Then one night, after thousands of prayers, where he had lifted his voice to God, six years of crying out a hundred times a day or more, he heard something in his dream. He heard a dream of someone talking back to him after these prayers. And he heard two sentences. Your hungers are rewarded. You are going home. And the second sentence was, get up and go. Your ship is ready. The next day, Patricius left the sheep on the hillside put his life in his hands and just left him there, walked 200 miles to the coast to a place he had never been before and found a ship ready to take off and said, you guys got room for one more? And they said, sure. And he got on the boat. The ship actually went to Europe, not Britain. And then Patricius took care of some business there before he finally went back home to Britain. When he was in Europe, he became a priest. He gave his life to God and said, I'm going to spend the rest of my life ministering to this God who rescued me from slavery. Then he made it back to Britain and to his family. Can you imagine the homecoming? They never thought they would see him again. And he comes home. And he lived with his family for a few years. 
And then Patricius had another dream, actually a series of dreams. This dream was of a man that he had known in Ireland who handed him thousands of letters, just a, a huge pile of them. And the top, of the, the top letter is titled, The Voice of the Irish. And he starts to read the letter in his dream, and he hears thousands of voices saying, we ask you to come and walk among us once more. And he had this vision, or one very similar to it, several more times, until one of those dreams like that ended with a voice that was familiar to him saying, he who gave his life for you is the one who is speaking to you. So Patricius went back to Ireland, not as a slave this time, but as a missionary. And if you haven't already figured it out, the English form of the name Patricius is Patrick. And that's how St. Patrick made it to Ireland twice. Can you imagine, could you go back to a place that you had previously been desperate to leave? Could you go back to the people who had enslaved you and nearly killed you with neglect and tell them, I have good news for you. The fact that Patrick went back to Ireland at all is enough to make him a saint. But the really amazing thing is, he succeeded. There's some controversy about whether Patrick was the first missionary to Ireland. There may have been some others, but Patrick was the most successful missionary to Ireland. Everything that we know for sure about Patrick, including everything I just told you about his life, comes from St. Patrick's Confession, uh, a brief account of his life and a defense uh, of his ministry in Ireland. St. Patrick's Confession starts like this. I am Patrick, a sinner, most unlearned, the least of all the faithful, and utterly despised by many. The Confession is brief. It prints out to about eight pages. And within those eight pages, there are over 200 scripture references, most of them about God's desire to save people, even unto the ends of the earth. The reason Patrick wrote his confession, kind of reading between the lines, he wrote it because he felt the need to defend himself against some accusations that were circulating about him back home in Britain. People started wondering, why is that dude over there? <laughs> the, the whole Roman Empire avoided this place. Why did that guy go? And he doesn't go into detail about what the accusations were, but they seem to revolve around the idea that he was in it to make money, that he was doing uh, mission work in order to benefit financially. And his answer to that is priceless. I testify in truth and in joy of heart before God and his holy angels that I never had any reason except the gospel and its promises why I should ever return to the people from whom once before I barely escaped. Patrick doesn't go into detail, much detail, about his ministry in Ireland because he says he doesn't want to bore his readers. What he does say is that he baptized thousands of people, from slaves to the sons and daughters of kings, that he appointed and ordained clergy everywhere he went. He was reproducing ministers to the gospel, and that he was in nearly constant danger during his mission. He says there were 12 times God delivered him out of deadly danger, and many more times when God warned him ahead of time of deadly danger. And he says in his confession, daily I expect murder, fraud, or captivity, or whatever it may be. But I fear none of these things because of the promises of heaven. I have cast myself into the hands of God Almighty, who rules everywhere. A lot of what we most often hear about the ministry of Patrick is legend. He didn't drive the snakes out of Ireland because there weren't any snakes there when he got there. Uh, Ireland is an island surrounded by cold water. There's not a lot of snakes trying to get there. Uh, some have suggested that the snake story is a legend about Patrick driving out the Druids, uh, the people who were encouraging worship of idols and, and other gods. Maybe. Uh, we really don't know whether he used the shamrock to teach about the Trinity, but we do know what he taught about the Trinity because it's in his confession. He says, There is no other God, nor ever was, nor will be, than God the Father, unbegotten, without beginning, from whom is all beginning, the Lord of the universe, as we have been taught and his son Jesus Christ, whom we declare to have always been with the Father, spiritually and ineffably begotten by the Father before the beginning of the world, before all beginning. And by him, by Jesus, are made all things visible and invisible. He was made man, and having defeated death, was received into heaven by the Father. And he has given him all power over all names in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue shall confess to him that Jesus Christ is Lord and God, in whom we believe and whose advent, whose second coming, we expect soon to be, judge of the living and the dead, who will give to every man according to his deeds. And he has poured forth upon us abundantly the Holy Spirit, the gift and pledge of immortality, who makes those who believe and obey sons of God and joint heirs with Christ. And him do we confess and adore, one God in the Trinity of the Holy Name. Woo, that'll preach. Uh, that's good theology right there. And preach he did. 
Patrick baptized thousands of people in a country where there was no place that you could find thousands of people in one place. They didn't have cities. He had to travel a lot to find thousands of people. He kept busy and he kept moving. How did he do it? How did he convince these crazed barbarian warriors who fought naked to take up the cross of Christ? We don't really know for sure. Thomas Cahill wrote an amazing little book called How the Irish Saved Civilization. And by that he means Western civilization. There are plenty of other kinds of civilization. But How the Irish Saved Western Civilization, Cahill suggests they must have been impressed by his courage, by the fact that he showed up at all, by the fact that uh, these other British people and other Roman people avoided them and he was there, that he came, that he clearly wasn't afraid of them. Uh, I think they must have wondered at a man on a mission of peace in a country that worshipped war. Uh, and I suspect he told his story a lot. I was a slave here, you know, up there. I was a slave here for six years. God saved me and helped me escape, and then he sent me back here to save you. And I think that story must have resonated with a lot of people. Brings us to another amazing thing about Patrick. He only has two surviving written works. The other one is a letter to bishops back in Britain asking them to help him with something. There was a minor British king whose soldiers had done the reverse of what had happened to Patrick. They had sent uh, raiders into Ireland and were kidnapping people and making them slaves in Britain. Um, this king, by the way, was theoretically a Christian king, and these soldiers were theoretically Christian soldiers, and they were doing that. And so Patrick, the former slave, sends a letter to the British bishops and says, you know what, <laughs> uh, you can guess how he felt about that. And this makes St. Patrick, by the way, one of the first people in history to write without any condition saying that the institution of slavery is wrong uh, and needs to be abolished. And this is the most amazing thing. Within a generation of Patrick's ministry in Ireland, the Irish slave trade was abolished. Uh, nobody from Britain was going to take slaves from Ireland and nobody from Ireland was going to take slaves from Britain. After Patrick, there is no more record of human sacrifice in Ireland. Ireland changed because of Patrick's ministry. So that's just one illustration of what Paul says in Colossians chapter 5. This sermon is actually about putting on the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. This sermon is actually about Christ being all and in all. This sermon is actually about this crazy notion that a person becomes new in Jesus Christ. And the things that used to separate us from other people get broken down by the peace that God makes in Jesus Christ. We've talked about barbarians. We've seen an example of slaves and free men. But remember who wrote Colossians. The Apostle Paul must have felt just as nearly strange at preaching the gospel to uncircumcised Gentiles as Patrick felt preaching the gospel to the Irish. Paul, who was so dedicated to God's law that he was a Pharisee and persecuted his fellow Jews that he thought were blaspheming by worshiping Jesus Christ, he ends up the apostle to the Gentiles, living and working and preaching to people that he would have spent the earlier part of his life desperately avoiding until he met Jesus. And Jesus sent him and said, you're going to be my guy <laughs> to the Gentiles. Paul was the prototype for all the craziness that we see in Patrick's life. Paul was constantly threatened with death. Paul was accused of preaching the gospel for his own financial benefit. Uh, Paul preached in front of slaves and preached in front of kings. And Paul was surrounded by brothers and sisters in Christ in places that he had never originally intended to go. And Paul did all that too. And that's what I love about the stories of Paul and of Patrick. It's not just that God reaches across all boundaries. It's not just that God reaches across religious boundaries. These people worship this God and these people worship that God. God reaches across that. It's not just that God reaches across racial boundaries. These are the uncircumcised and these are the circumcised. These are the barbarians and we're the Greeks. It's not just that God reaches across that. It's not just that God reaches across socioeconomic boundaries. These are the slaves and these are the free and they're separated and God reaches across and draws all those people in. It's that God recruits helpers from the least likely people to do it. Who shall I get to be the apostle to the Gentiles? The Pharisee who persecutes the Christians. <laughs> I'll get him. Who shall I get to be the apostle to the Irish? The atheist kid who was kidnapped to Ireland. I'll get him to do it. God apparently loves doing that. Now this is where it gets personal. It's not just that God reaches across all boundaries to bring people to himself. It's that God recruits helpers from the least likely people to do it. I am Patrick, a sinner, most unlearned, the least of the faithful, utterly despised by many. Now you take Patrick out of that and hear it with your name. I am so-and-so, 
a sinner, most unlearned, least of all the faithful, and utterly despised by many. That's who we all are. And now hear God say in response to that, good, let's get to work. So, you know any barbarians? You got anybody close to your life who needs saving or needs to experience the fellowship of believers, a fellowship that breaks down barriers that separate us from other people? The real fellowship of believers that Paul talks about in Colossians? You got anyone living near you who's outside the boundaries of polite civilization? The kind of people that most people would rather avoid? I suspect some of you have barbarians living across the street from you. I suspect living very near you are pillaging hordes of unwashed ruffians that you share an alley with or that you work with or that you sit next to in class. Maybe you're related to barbarians. Maybe you have barbarians in law. But guess what? Some of you are laughing a little too hard at that. Guess what? No one is outside the boundaries of the redeeming love of God. And God is recruiting, my friends. God is on a recruiting drive, recruiting helpers to spread the word, to share the truth, that you can be new in Christ Jesus. It takes, like Paul learned and like Patrick learned, courage in the face of danger. It takes perseverance through misunderstanding because people aren't going to get what you're doing until you keep doing it. And it takes, above all, love. Christ-like love for the pillaging hordes. Christ-like love for the men that God made mad. God is recruiting helpers to cross the street, to cross the alley, to cross the tracks, to cross borders in his name. As I thought about those of you who may have barbarians in your family, I thought about Patrick's statement that he had to return to the people from whom once before I barely escaped. <laughs> but do you remember what brought him back? The gospel and its promises. I'm not talking about situations of abuse. I'm not talking about uh, reconnecting with those who have, have abused us in the past. But I am talking about people that it, it's so easy for us to say, you know what, I'll just let you stay over there, separated by the boundaries that you've put up, and be crazy over there, and I want nothing to do with you. I'm, I'm just suggesting that God may be calling those of us who have avoided them, whoever them are, that it may be us that God intends to spread the gospel to them. I want to end with a prayer, one that's attributed to St. Patrick. It's usually called St. Patrick's Breastplate. Ancient Roman and other warriors uh, would, not the Irish because they fought naked, but other warriors would put armor on, and on their armor they would inscribe uh, spells and, and incantations that were supposed to protect them from harm. Um, this is St. Patrick's version. It's not a physical breastplate, it's a prayer. And this is what the, the, the legend goes, the story goes, this is what he would put on. This is the prayer he prayed. There's no way to be sure that it's his, but it is definitely Irish and it's definitely old. And it sure sounds like something that he would say. So I'm going to read the version that's been modified into a hymn because it flows, you know, like a hymn. So imagine Patrick starting his day of barbarian evangelism with this. And now imagine yourself starting your day of barbarian evangelism with it as well. I bind unto myself today the strong name of the Trinity by invocation of the same, the three in one and one in three. I bind this today to me forever by power of faith, Christ's incarnation, his baptism in Jordan River, his death on cross for my salvation, his bursting from the spiced tomb, his riding up the heavenly way, his coming at the day of doom, I bind unto myself today. I bind unto myself the power of the great love of cherubim, the sweet well done in judgment hour, the service of the seraphim, confessor's faith, apostle's word, the patriarch's prayers, the prophet's scrolls, all good deeds done unto the Lord, and purity of virgin souls. I bind, unto, I bind unto myself today the virtues of the starlit heaven, the glorious sun's life-giving ray, the whiteness of the moon at even, the flashing of the lightning free, the whirling winds' tempestuous shocks, the stable earth, the deep salt sea, around the old eternal rocks. I bind unto myself today the power of God to hold and lead, his eye to watch, his might to stay, his ear to hearken to my need the wisdom of my God to teach, his hand to guide, his shield to ward, the word of God to give me speech, his heavenly host to be my guard. Against the demon snares of sin, the vice that gives temptation force, the natural lusts that war within, the hostile men that mar my course, few or many, far or nigh, in every place and in all hours, against their fierce hostility, I bind to me these holy powers. Against all Satan's spells and wiles, against false words of heresy, 
against the knowledge that defiles, against the heart's idolatry, against the wizard's evil craft, against the death wound and the, burn, the, death wound and the burning, the choking wave, the poison shaft. Protect me, Christ, till thy returning. Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort and restore me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger, Christ in hearts of all that love me, Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. I bind unto myself the name, the strong name of the Trinity, by invocation of the same, the three in one and one in three, by whom all nature hath creation, eternal Father, Spirit, Word, Praise to the Lord of my salvation. Salvation is of Christ the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I love to tell the story of what you have done. What you have done in the life of people like Paul and the life of people like Patrick. Grow in us, God, a love of telling the story of what you have done in our lives, those of us who are believers. Grow, God, in the lives of those who have not yet put their faith in you a desire to be made new, a desire to be part of a new family, a desire to break down the walls that separate them from you and from other people. Heavenly Father, help us to see, to hear the voice of those who need us to walk among them. Heavenly Father, help us to hear your voice, the one who died for us, sending us, and help us, God, to have the courage and the love to go, no matter where it is that you send. It may be across the street, across the classroom, across the the cafeteria, across our workspace. Help us to see those who need your gospel and help us to be courageous enough to listen. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.